Very good morning all of you. I am Dr. M.C. Nataraja. I welcome all the students uh, for my session 3. So this is uh, for the subject Design of Steel Structural Elements 18 CV 61 offered by VTU Vishweshwaraya Technological University for semester 6. In fact, in the last class, so we have discussed about uh, the advantages and disadvantages of steel as a structural element. In fact, we have also seen as to what are all the different types of sections that are being used in the design of steel structures. In fact, we have the classifications such as uh, I sections, channel sections, angle sections, T sections, tubes, wires and so on and so forth. So many of these things uh, we have discussed in greater details. And uh, today, so let us uh, take up the topic on different types of loads and their combinations. So many of these things, uh, what I am going to discuss today is uh, available in uh, IS 800 2007. And also we have special uh, national course of practices where a lot of information related to loads and load combinations are available. So I will be introducing to some of these uh, course today. Now as for the types of loads are concerned, so it is basically classified as dead loads. Dead load is generally referred to as the permanent load and as you know this includes the sulphate of the material, floor covering, suspended ceiling and even the partition load also has to be considered as a dead load. So some of these loads uh, you must have already seen in the analysis and design of RCC structure being taught in the previous semester. So the next load is uh, referred to as the live load. So it is uh, not a permanent load. The location is not fixed. It includes uh, the load of the furniture, load caused by equipments and occupants of the building. Sometimes uh, it is also referred to as the imposed load. The third load is uh, the wind load. It exerts a pressure or a section on the exterior of the building. And today, especially in case of uh, tower structure, we need to analyze the structure for the effect of the wind and all the structural parameters are to be assessed and then we have to take up the design. So we have the earthquake load. Earthquake load is also referred to as the seismic load. The effects of the ground motions are simulated by a system of horizontal forces. So kindly say the dead load, live load produces the vertical effect. So they are referred to as the gravity loads. The wind load and the earthquake load produces lateral effects. They are also sometimes referred to as the lateral loading system. So we also have the snow load. It varies with the geographical location and of course the drift. So let us see what these uh, different loads and how the combinations of these loads can be considered in the analysis. We also have uh, the different uh, uh, loads other than the five important loads being discussed. So they are sometimes called as the special loads, hydrostatic pressure, especially for the design of foundation, we need to consider this. And also we have uh, the load coming uh, into picture. So because of the pressure exerted by the water, as you have in case of a dam analysis and design and soil pressure. And if the load is applied suddenly, definitely it causes uh, impact and that has to be accounted for and if the load is applied and removed many a times over the life of the structure then that load introduces uh, the fatigue, fatigue stress so that must be considered and accounted for in the analysis and design and of course uh, we also have the loads uh, because of the presence of the crane in an industrial building, erection load comes into picture in many of the steel structures, temperature, vibration also introduce uh, additional stresses that need to be considered along with the other loads. Now coming to the load combinations, the following are some of the important uh, load combinations are being discussed in uh, IS 800. Dead load plus imposed load is one combination and of course the dead load itself is a combination where the structure is under construction, two or three stories of uh, the structure has been constructed and uh, the third story or the fourth sto story is being uh, taken up and in that situation so the structure should be safe uh, from the point of dead load and its uh, behavior. 
The second uh, combination, as you know, it is a dead load plus the imposed load. As I mentioned, the imposed load is also referred to as the live load. The third combination is, so we have the dead load and imposed load. And during that time, so there may be an effect of the wind or the earthquake load. So generally wind combined with earthquake is not considered, which I will be discussing later. So we have to have the dead load, imposed load and wind load as one combination. Dead load, imposed load and earthquake load is the second combination. Assume that the structure is uh, occupied, obviously dead load and live load comes into picture. And at that instant of time, so there could be a heavy wind or an earthquake coming into picture. So there is a possibility so that dead load, imposed load and either of the two, wind load or earthquake can come on the structure and for that the structure need to be analyzed. So the next is uh, the structure is not occupied, the building is not occupied, of course we have the dead load and during that time, so there may be a serious wind coming into picture or an earthquake load coming into picture. So in such cases, obviously we need to consider the combination dead load plus wind load or the dead load plus earthquake load where the structure is not occupied. So the last one at the time of construction, so a part of the building is constructed, so obviously we have the dead load and of course the erection load. So there are uh, different types of uh, loads uh, that comes into picture at the time of uh, erection. So it could be the materials that are being used at the time of construction or lot lot of loads are being uh, put in different locations of the structure at the time of construction and that also needed to be considered. So these are all the various combinations of the loading and all these uh, loads as you know will introduce uh, some sort of a uh, distress and all these uh, distress in the form of uh, structural action so need to be analyzed and for that the structure need to be designed. So for this, so these are uh, the combinations uh, that ought to be considered mainly from the point of analysis of the structure as a whole or the component of the structure. So let us see a few more things uh, from the point of uh, these loads and uh, what loads need to be considered and how these loads needed to be assessed. As I mentioned, the wind load and the earthquake loads shall not be assumed to act simultaneously. The effect of each shall be considered separately. So the reason is uh, the probability of the combination of wind and earthquake and where these two loads are becoming critical in the analysis of a structure is uh, uh, very unlikely. So it cannot uh, happen just like that. The probability is uh, very very low. So there is no point in considering uh, this particular combination of wind load and earthquake. So if you consider this combination, obviously the structural effects are uh, maximum and uh, we need to provide uh, heavy sections and obviously many a times the design will become highly uneconomical. So that is the reason so we will be considering the wind load and the earthquake load separately not as a combination. The effect of the crane load to be considered under imposed load shall include the vertical loads, eccentricity effects, impact factors, lateral load, this also sometimes referred to as the surge and the longitudinal thrust which is acting in the horizontal direction and of course not acting simultaneously, they need to be considered separately, the surge and the longitudinal thrust. Once we need to consider these loads across the crane cross section and then along the crane cross section. So these uh, uh, loads will come into picture in the analysis and design of uh, gantry girder. So this is one of the interesting topic uh, in the advanced design of steel structures. So probably in the next semester, so if this advanced design of steel structure is being taught, uh, so you will be exposed to many of these loads and we need to calculate uh, these loads considering the different course of practices. Lastly, the stresses developed due to the secondary effects such as uh, handling, erection, temperature and settlement of the foundation shall be appropriately added to the stresses calculated from the different combinations of the load which we have already discussed. Now as far as the calculation of uh, these loads are concerned, we need to refer to the codes of practices. And these codes of practices are generally referred to as the building code. So we have the national building code and different codes of our country and also we have the international codes of practices. 
and all these codes need to be used depending on the situation and the importance of uh, the design what we take up in practice. So the building code is uh, nothing but a legal document containing uh, the requirements related to such things as structural safety, fire safety, plumbing and ventilation. So many of the requirements uh, for the building needed to be considered and accordingly the different loads uh, that are acting on the structure need to be calculated mainly from the point of analysis and design. So this building code does not provide the design procedures but it specifies the design requirements and all these design requirements ought to be satisfied at the time of analysis and of course at the time of design. Now we have the National Building Code of uh, India. It is uh, referred to as uh, NBC. So I request all the students to refer this particular code and see what this code is all about. So definitely one copy of the code must be available in the library or it must be available in the reference. So many of the codes of practices uh, that are available in India cater into different materials, cater into the analysis and design of uh, different structures using different materials. Everything is being compiled and it is made available in the form of one single document. So you need to refer to this particular code. So may not be as a student, but so this particular code is really required. Uh, so when you take up uh, some sort of a good analysis and design as a structural consultant later in your career. So we have many codes uh, published by Bureau of Indian Standard. So BIS uh, we refer and uh, for this particular uh, uh, calculation of loads, so we have uh, separate codes published by this uh, Bureau of Indian Standard. Now what is the importance of code? So as I mentioned, the code uh, gives the design specifications. So provide guidance for the design of structural members and their connections. Now as far as this particular subject is concerned, so we will be designing the C structure and also the connections using uh, rivets and bolts and also using the welds. For all these things, uh, different codes are needed. So they have no legal standard on their own, but they can easily be adopted by reference as part of a building code. IS 800 2007 is the mother code as far as the design of steel is concerned. So this is what the document uh, will be referring to as far as this uh, subject is concerned. Now other uh, important uh, codes mainly from the point of uh, load calculation is being listed here. The code IS875. So this is uh, available in uh, different parts. So if you see the part 1 which is published in 1987, the title of the code is Code of Practice for the Design of uh, Loads Other Than Earthquake Load for buildings and structure. So kindly say what this particular uh, code gives. It gives you the information about the loads from the point of design and hence it is the design loads mainly for the buildings and structures other than earthquake. So in fact we have separate codes available. So when you want to analyze the structure for the seismic effect which I will be discussing later. So this IS875 at present is available in uh, 5 parts. The part 1 mainly deals with uh, dead load. So this code gives you the unit weights of building materials and stored materials. And of course uh, earlier uh, this code was referred to as uh, IS 1911 published in 1967 and many of the information that was there in this code is now pushed to part 1 under the dead load. So I will be showing this uh, code a bit later. The part 2 mainly deals with uh, the imposed loads, part 3 wind loads, part 4 snow loads, part 5 the special loads and load combinations. So this is what uh, the code uh, I mentioned because the earlier uh, 5 parts are the codes for the loads for buildings other than the earthquake structures. So now for the earthquake resisting structures. So we have this particular code IS1893-2002 criteria for earthquake resistant design of structures. So maybe you will be using this code uh, when you go to 
or the next semester where advanced analysis of design of steel structure comes into picture or if some students pursue their education for their masters so definitely so we are having a subject on earthquake analysis and subsequent design of rcc as well as steel as a part of uh, the design so in that case uh, this particular code is very useful the code is now split into five parts so similar to the earlier code so part 1 part 2 part 3 part 4 part 5 and few of these parts are right now published by bureau of uh, indian standard that is and uh, these codes are available in the library as well so there are two additional codes uh, connected with uh, earthquake so i guess 4326-1993 Indian Standard Code of Practice for Earthquake Resistant Design and Construction of Buildings so which is the second revision and is already available and you can also google this uh, code by putting this number and you will be getting a copy IS-13827-1993 is uh, another uh, Indian Standard Code this gives you the guidelines for improving earthquake resistance of uh, earthen buildings especially in the subject on uh, restoration and retrofitting so probably these two codes must have been introduced now i have just uh, shown the photographs uh, of the two codes so the low codes connected with uh, the design loads and of course other than the earthquake loads part one part two part three part four part five so we also have the international codes of practices and many of these codes are being uh, discussed in the mother code IS 800 and also in the codes on loading standard so a mention of uh, some of these uh, international codes you will be able to see in the initial pages of the codes ASTM codes American Society for Testing of Materials so being practiced uh, in America so we also have AISI codes American Iron and Steel Institute codes Euro code so meant for European countries we also have BS code, British standard codes, AS bar NZ codes, so Australian standard and New Zealand code. So earlier uh, these codes were available separately, but now there is a unification of the codes and the code name goes by Australian and New Zealand codes, AS bar NZ codes. So we also have the handbook of uh, steel construction published by the Canadian Institute of Steel Construction in 2006 and few codes published by ASTM American Society for Testing of Materials A992 so one particular code I have mentioned here so this is uh, the code connected with standard specifications for structural steel shapes American Society for Testing and Materials published in 2006 so many of these international codes of uh, practices is being followed especially when you take up some uh, projects and also when you start doing some research maybe as a part of your final year project or when you go to your uh, uh, masters so many of these codes needed to be referred and we need to do a quality projects now before uh, i go to the classification of section so let me introduce to these uh, different codes which i have discussed so let us uh, take uh, this particular code so kindly see what the code I am uh, presenting to you so this is uh, what IS uh, 875 part 1 published in uh, 1987 and of course uh, all the information connected with this code is being uh, printed here so what was the previous code so when this code was published when it is reaffirmed for usage so some details uh, connected with uh, the publication you will be able to get it so whenever you happen to refer any code please see that you always refer to the latest code and many a times the latest codes will not be available in the google but whatever the codes that are available in the google as a free codes many a times uh, they are the previous versions of the code so we need to actually see what is the latest version that is available so by going through the title of these codes uh, in the bureau of indian standard website and many a times you may have to purchase these codes kindly say the name code of practice for design loads other than earthquake for buildings and structures so this is what uh, i showed as a photo in my ppt presentation so the part one is uh, dead load what this code mainly deals is so it deals with unit weights of building materials 
and stored materials. So kindly see, so this is uh, having a price group of 12. So what is the cost of the code? So you'll be able to get from this uh, information. So this is uh, what the content and of course uh, we have uh, the various uh, building materials so that are being uh, considered it could be acoustic materials aggregates and of course aggregate is uh, really uh, required in concrete mix design so different uh, types of aggregate coarse aggregate fine aggregate organic aggregate and as best as a roofing material depending on the size depending on the thickness what is the unit weight of asbestos per meter square is required of course uh, many a times we need the weight of the bitumen especially in case of uh, pavement analysis and design and bricks so what is uh, the unit weight of one brick so depending on the density and of course we also have uh, different types of boards and cement cement concrete and of course we have the plain cement concrete pre-stressed cement concrete and reinforced cement concrete so many a times for concrete we take 2400 kg per meter cube as the density and uh, this is uh, a general value but of course uh, for the plain concrete it varies from 2300 and it may go up to 2350 kg per meter cube when you start introducing uh, reinforcement depending on what percentage of reinforcement you have put and whether the section is a slab where the reinforcement is uh, put uh, at a larger spacing and sometimes in case of heavily reinforced beam, so the density of the concrete is slightly on the higher side. So it is 2400 kg per meter cube going up to 2500 kg per meter cube. So 2400 kg is uh, 24 kilo newton. So 2400 kg is 2.4 tons and it is 24 kilo newton per meter cube. And of course you also have uh, the density. As far as cement mortar is concerned, depending on what proportion of mortar you are considering, whether it is 1 is to 1, 1 is to 2, 1 is to 3, because uh, in case of mortar, you know cement, the specific gravity is uh, definitely on the higher side, 3.15 compared to sand, and we also have water, and as the cement percentage increases, so the dead weight of that mortar also increases. So like that, uh, so the various other materials uh, so that can be considered in a building is being listed and uh, for the different types of terrazzo tile also we will be able to see the load and flooring materials and of course some of the miscellaneous materials so many of these things are there and uh, before I go to uh, the other things uh, so let us take uh, one particular thing uh, uh, from the point of uh, understanding the importance of this code so let us take up uh, the aggregate of course this is not required for uh, steel and uh, depending on uh, the different types of uh, broken stone ballast if it is a dry one so it is uh, varying from 15.7 to something like 18.35 kilo newton and uh, this is per meter cube so you can see at the end so it is whether it is for per meter cube or per meter cube so or, or even for per meter length as you have in case of a rod so everything will be seen here and this is in terms of kilo newton and also you can see what is the equivalent uh, value in terms of kg so 1600 to 1870 so 1 kg is approximately so 9.81 newton so that is the reason so this value is uh, slightly different and even if you have uh, the broken bricks so depending on uh, how this uh, broken brick is being manufactured so we have the different density so what i want to tell you is uh, just because you are using an aggregate or a brick you cannot simply assume one particular value uh, from the point of calculation of load. so all these loads uh, in the form of a partition so you may have to take it while designing uh, a beam or a slab so either in an RCC building or it can be in a steel building and also you have uh, as I mentioned uh, the asbestos depending on the thickness the weight per meter square needed to be calculated and uh, I will show you certain things uh, uh, related to uh, 
So this is a high density wood. This is a particle board depending on what is the density with which uh, the board is being pressed. So the density keep keep on changes. So that information also you'll be able to get it. Different types of bricks. And of course, uh, so this is where uh, the different thickness of the manhole cover comes into picture. A cast iron manhole cover. So having a dimension. So like this. So kindly see the different weights. So it is not going to be constant. So we need to identify depending on what type of manhole cover we are looking for. So like that uh, we have for metals. And also kindly see here uh, fiber base, gypsum, iron. So iron as you know the specific gravity of iron is uh, 7.8. But here for pig iron, so the density is 7200 kg. And if you take uh, cast iron, so it is close to 7000 to 7100 dot. And if you have a wrought iron, it goes up to 7700. So this is what the density kg per meter cube. You can see here. So obviously, the specific gravity is uh, close to 7.2 to 7.7. .7. So compared to water, 1 meter cube of water and 1 meter cube of steel if you take steel is definitely 7 to 7.7 times heavier compared to water so like that uh, so there are uh, different uh, types of materials so all this information uh, so you will be able to get it so this is what the code you need to refer especially when you want to calculate the dead load of the structure or even the structural components now let us uh, take up uh, the second one so this is uh, the code connected with uh, imposed load now kindly see the title 875 part 2 again published in 1987 so this is for the imposed load so imposed load is also referred to as the live load so the calculation of uh, live load so depends on the type of the structure and uh, the type of the occupancy so these are all uh, the contents so kindly go through the content and this need to be referred and definitely students must have seen this code in the design of uh, RCC structure and before I go to this code so let us see some of the international codes of practices uh, being uh, considered while drafting this uh, code so this is the British standard so you can also see the title Australian standard, New Zealand standard. So many, all these uh, things uh, you will be able to get it. And sometimes uh, you may have to pursue your studies uh, in abroad, either in US or in uh, UK, Germany. So that is where your master's MS comes into picture. So an information of uh, the relevant course of practices uh, of those countries is also important. Now kindly see the occupancy so this is the imposed load as far as the occupancy is concerned it is uh, the use group how exactly a particular building is being used and how that occupancy as a group is being uh, uh, defined and we have what is referred to as the assembly building so this is the first category of uh, occupancy classification and uh, if we just uh, go through the details being mentioned here so this is uh, where uh, the buildings in the form of theatres, picture houses, assembly halls, city halls comes into picture. So even in case of assembly hall, we cannot take one particular value of uh, the imposed load. So depending on the type of the assembly hall and what is the size and uh, the purpose. So based on that, uh, so you may have to define uh, the loads. All these things are being discussed and uh, we'll have a glance of some of these things uh, in the subsequent pages. So the second occupancy is uh, the business building and uh, you know as far as the business buildings are concerned we have different types of uh, offices as you can see here so bank buildings professional establishments courthouses of course libraries so when it comes to the question of library so what library is a question we need to ask so in fact we have the libraries in schools libraries of colleges and libraries of professional institutions and also we have uh, many uh, public uh, libraries also where uh, too many books uh, are being stored. 
So obviously the load per meter square will vary considerably. In fact, uh, the next uh, classification is the office building. And of course, the different types of uh, office building comes into picture depending on what type of administrative activities that are going on there. So it can be a clerical work related administration, handling of money, telephone, telegraphic uh, operating uh, administrative buildings. So many such things comes into picture and depending on how exactly the building is being used. So we have to identify the load. And sometimes we may take uh, 2 kN per meter square but the maximum may be 2.5, 3 or 4. When the load is increased from 2 to 4, so you know the effect of the load increases almost by 200%. And that is where the importance of structural parameters, especially the bending moment shear force comes into picture. So you simply cannot take the load as 4 kN per meter square when the purpose and the occupancy is such that where the load is close to 2 kN per meter square. So definitely, so the bending moment and shear force will be almost 200% more and your design is definitely two times costlier. So that is the reason you need to be very very careful. And of course you also have the industrial building classification. So what different types of industrial buildings depending on again the purpose for which the building is being used. So let us take one particular example for the calculation of the imposed load especially for the design of slabs and this design of roof slab in RCC you have studied so kindly see few things being discussed here if it is a dwelling house so meant for residential purpose so you can take a uniformly distributed load of 2 kN per meter square and of course for balconies so you can take it as 3 kN per meter square because we need to design the balcony slightly for a heavier load and in case uh, any accident happens uh, the con consequences are very severe and many of the balconies uh, so definitely they are cantilever in nature so designed for heavy load and definitely the probability of occurrence of that heavy load if it is really not there so probably the failure is not going to take place and uh, kindly see the live load especially considered uh, in uh, hotels hostels and of course uh, in uh, lodging uh, buildings dormitories so definite it definitely it will vary from minimum of 2 kN meter square up to 5 kN meter square so it is uh, not for the entire uh, uh, building you need to take 5 especially for the storeroom of uh, that uh, hostel or the lodging building so you may have to take uh, 5 and for the other uh, portions depending on the purpose for which it is used so we have to consider the loads and similarly in case of educational building so the load definitely starts from minimum of 3 and it goes uh, up to 5 and uh, there are certain situations where you can even take the load as 2 kN per meter square especially for toilets and bathroom so the probability of a heavy load coming in these uh, floors is uh, not that likely so like that uh, so for all other buildings so some information is available and uh, this is a very important and interesting code especially in the advanced design of steel structure so you have to refer all these codes and especially when you go to your masters yes uh, the calculation of loads is one important uh, topic that need to be studied in greater details so this is uh, all about uh, the part 2 and if you go to part 3 so this is another interesting code so kindly see what this code is so as I mentioned this is the code connected with uh, wind load so maybe at this stage uh, for the design of uh, steel as an introductory subject uh, so you will not be uh, exploring many of uh, these uh, information but still an introduction to this code is uh, very much needed what this particular code and what it really deals with now as for the wind load is concerned so how to calculate the wind on a given exposed area is very important and uh, many of the important uh, parameters so that are needed in the wind analysis is being discussed and of course uh, the different terrain categories comes into picture solidarity ratio comes into picture 
so topographical feature comes into picture whether the structure is situated on a mountain or on a hill or an escarpment something like that now as far as the wind speed is concerned so we need to identify so depending on the geographical uh, locations so what is the wind speed and uh, how that wind speed is uh, exerting a pressure on the exposed area so that is uh, very important and uh, in order to determine the design wind speed and later the wind pressure the first and the foremost thing that is needed is uh, the basic wind speed so we need to calculate what is this uh, basic wind speed so this information is uh, provided by the meteorological department and uh, for our country so this information for different places is made available in the form of a table and of course it is also available uh, in the form of a map so which uh, i'll be showing later so once you know the basic wind speed which is uh, determined uh, for a height of about uh, 10 meter uh, for a category 2 so it is uh, some category where the obstruction to the wind is not uh, that much so that is where uh, the wind speed is uh, recorded and that wind speed is uh, made available in the form of uh, documents so once the basic wind speed is known we need to calculate the design wind speed so the design wind speed at any height uh, you can calculate so this is the design wind speed at any height that can be calculated based on what is the basic wind speed at a height of 10 meter so this you can get it from a map or from the table and that need to be multiplied with uh, some coefficients so these coefficients are called as uh, the probability coefficients and the first probability coefficient is called as the probability factor itself it's the risk coefficient the second one is called as terrain height and structure size factor this is the second coefficient and the third one is uh, depending on uh, where the structure is located whether it is on a mountain or on an escarpment so this uh, factor need to be calculated so that is where the topography of the building comes into picture the surroundings of the building comes into picture so these are the three factors so that need to be considered here as a multiplication factor applied onto the basic wind speed so we will be able to calculate uh, the basic wind speed with these uh, correction factors and from that uh, we need to calculate what is the design wind speed at any height so the height factor also comes into picture in k2 so there are uh, different categories of the uh, terrain uh, i will not be going into the greater details because uh, it takes a lot of time but i just want to tell you that there is a systematic uh, procedure available and we have a uh, exhaust uh, information in the form of uh, part 3 so this is uh, what i was uh, mentioning so this is uh, the indian map uh, so that will give you the information about the basic wind speed and uh, if we just see one table here uh, so you will be able to identify the risk factor how much of risk you will be able to take depending on the type of the building and of course for what age the building is designed so this is where the life of the structure comes into picture so in uh, this particular code the life of the structure is assumed to be 50 years and if that is the case for all the terrain categories so we take the coefficient as one so for the first uh, uh, terrain it is uh, 33 and this is 39 44 uh, 47 50 55 so these are all uh, the basic wind speeds so this is the basic wind speed so depending on the locality as i mentioned it is available in the form of a table also so you can go to that particular uh, appendix and uh, see what the basic wind speed is the basic wind speed for mysore and bangalore is uh, taken as uh, 33 meter per second so this is the speed with which uh, the wind comes so and uh, uh, impacted on a structure so this is the maximum speed in impact and uh, if the structure is uh, a temporary one so where the life is about five years so the correction factor is uh, substantially less than one and if the life is 25 years uh, the correction factor is definitely less than one but it is rather close to one so 0 0.9 uh, to almost one so that is how uh, so the value changes and if the life is more than 50 years so obviously we need to take more risk because uh, all these wind speeds are uh, determined based on the return period of 50 years so what has happened in the previous 50 years more or less the same thing can happen in the coming 50 years but what happens after 75 years 
or even after 100 years uh, is not known to us. So that is the reason. So we need to have greater factor of safety. So that is the reason many of these risk factors uh, are more than one. Again, depending on the basic wind speed. So these are all uh, some of the information. So this is uh, the table that gives you the information about uh, K1 factor. So that depends on the category, terrain category 1, category 2, category 3, category 4. And of course for different heights starting from 10 meters and going up to 500 meters. So as the height increases, the factor also increases. Obviously the design speed also increases. From that the design pressure, what you are going to calculate from the point of analysis, that also increases drastically. And of course, uh, as the class of the building, class A, B, C, so three different classes are being uh, defined depending on the uh, size of the structure, category 2, category 3 and uh, category 4. So anyway, so this is uh, not the time to explore the importance of this particular code. The main objective is to just tell the students that there is a core where a rigorous analysis of wind you may have to do it especially in case you want to design one complete industrial shed or a tower or a mast or a steel cooling tower where everything comes into picture. The height comes into picture, size comes into picture, terrain comes into picture and where exactly the structure is situated so the basic speed comes into picture. So with all these things, if you calculate the speed, the basic speed and then the design speed at any particular height. So this is what the design speed. So please see why you need to be very careful in calculation of the design wind speed. So this is V, the design wind speed squared. Whatever the speed we have calculated, that need to be squared. Even if you have committed a small error, so definitely the value increases like anything. The basic wind speed as I mentioned. So kindly see here. So kindly see here the basic wind speed instead of uh, 33, if you take it as 39 or even 44 or even as 55. So it is uh, in fact a very large value of the wind speed. So 39 compared to 39 and then squaring that. So the value will increase like anything. So you really cannot take uh, some values of basic wind speed just like that. So we need to be very very careful and from that uh, basic wind speed and applying all the correction factors and we need to calculate the design wind speed. The design wind speed square multiplied by 0.6. So 0.6 of V Z square is what is referred to as the wind pressure. The design wind pressure that need to be considered while calculating the forces on a building. Now if you have some uh, exposed area say you have a wall whose area is uh, a by area A is equal to say width B by depth D. So that is what the exposed area. So obviously, so if this pressure when you multiply with the exposed area, so we are going to get the total force that is acting on that particular exposed wall. So that is what the total winds force. So that need to be considered on that structural element. So there are so many other things comes into picture, external wind pressure, internal wind pressure. So, in fact, uh, as a part of this uh, introductory subject, uh, I think this much is uh, quite sufficient. So, whenever you have a time, please just go through some of these uh, uh, pages so that you will be able to appreciate the code. Now, let us uh, take uh, the part 4. So, the part 4 mainly deals with uh, the snow. So, in fact, uh, the snow constitute the dead load. So whatever the snow that comes on your say terrace and if it is uh, occupied for a depth of say x so the size of the terrace is known so length of the terrace width of the terrace is known and uh, if the depth of the collection of the snow if it is uh, say 10 centimeter so the volume of the snow can be calculated and of course if you multiply that with the density where the density of snow is very close to 1 in fact it is less than 1. So 1000 kg per meter cube is what the density of water as far as uh, the snow is concerned depending on uh, how the snow is uh, deposited and whether it is a hard deposition or a uh, some sort of a light deposition. So the weight will vary. So maybe 600, 700, 800 kg per meter cube is what the load. So you can approxim approximately calculate the load and then you can uh, do the design especially for those uh, regions uh, 
where snow is uh, likely to come uh, in that location. But otherwise, uh, depending on uh, how the snow is uh, coming and getting deposited, depending on uh, the type of the roof. So we have a lot of information available, how to calculate and how to make some sort of a assumption so that uh, the total weight of the snow can be calculated. So many of the information related to that we will be able to get from this code. So this is where the importance of uh, the snow comes into picture. So assume that this is uh, a terrace and where we have some sort of an obstruction like this and if you see in the morning when there is a heavy snow that has uh, occupied this uh, so probably the nature of the occupation of the snow will be something like this a greater concentration of the snow comes into picture near this uh, obstruction which is in the form of a partition and onto the either side of this partition so we'll be having uh, the snow getting deposited in different thicknesses so uh, when you have a situation of this type how the equivalent thickness and the equivalent uh, volume and then the corresponding dead weight can be calculated is what is being discussed in this particular code. So let us uh, go to the next code from the point of uh, introduction. So that is where the part 5 comes into picture. Now if you see this uh, part 5 code, it mainly deals with uh, special loads and we also have some information connected with uh, the combinations of uh, the loads that needed to be considered. So what are the special loads? Let me just uh, introduce to the special loads. So that is where uh, the loads in the form of uh, temperature effect comes into picture. As I mentioned, temperature is a special load, especially in the design of chimney. So this uh, need to be considered. And also in uh, some places where uh, there is a drastic change in the temperature right from morning to the afternoon, where it can be 10, 15 degrees centigrade in the morning and maybe in the afternoon it can go up to 40, 45, sometimes it can even go up to 50. So you may have to account for uh, the stresses that are likely to uh, introduce because of these temperature changes. And uh, the variation of the temperature in the different parts is also being uh, mentioned in the form of a map. And this is something connected with uh, the highest temperature being recorded in different places. So just uh, let us have a glance what is the situation close to Bangalore. So this is uh, where you have Bangalore, Madras, Mysore, Coimbatore. So kindly see this uh, locus. So this is uh, something uh, uh, close to 37 degrees. So this is there in Mysore, Coimbatore, so being the maximum temperature. And of course, uh, even I know in Mysore, maximum of 38 degrees centigrade has been recorded several times. And if you see the situation in Madras and uh, surrounding places in uh, Tamil Nadu, it is 42 to 45 so it is uh, quite obvious and also we have many places uh, in the northern part especially Gujarat and surrounding places so kindly see the temperature is uh, going up to 45 to 50 degrees centigrade and in many of the northeastern uh, side also we have uh, temperature going up to 40 degrees but it is not so high especially in uh, Srinagar and surrounding area so it, it, it is uh, close to 30 it is close to yeah there also it is uh, substantially higher because this is uh, the maximum temperature that can happen so 45 to 50 degree so in fact 50 degree is really really a horrible temperature it may not be there for a long period of time so maybe for a few hours and sometimes maybe for a few days uh, so such a high temperature of 47 48 50 comes into picture and lot lot of deformation can happen especially in steel structure and as a result of that uh, so a lot of distress especially for the joints comes into picture and even in RCC also a lot of cracks gets introduced and uh, that may uh, eventually uh, cause some sort of a serious distress leading to failure. And that is what the uh, map that, go, that gives you the maximum uh, temperature and uh, similar to that we have a chart which shows the lowest minimum temperature so that is there uh, uh, in some of the places. Again, let us see what is the situation surrounding Mysore and uh, this is uh, close to 12 degrees to 13 degrees. So if you see this particular uh, profile, so some sort of a contour, so close to Mysore, 12, 13, 14 degrees centigrade is what the minimum. But when you take Bangalore, it is still less than 10. So Bangalore temperature 
is much less compared to Mysore and if you go still down to um, towards Trivandrum so the minimum temperature is something like 17 degrees if this is what the situation in south uh, so can you see the situation in uh, Jammu and Kashmir where it is really cold in case of winter so it is uh, minus 7 minus 5 minus 2 means it is a sub-zero temperature so we have lot lot of problem as far as the sub-zero temperature effect is concerned especially for steel so that is where a mild steel tends to behave like a cast iron and also we have the problem of brittle fracture especially when the temperature goes below zero degree and this is not that this type of temperature will be there uh, uh, just for few hours or few days and many a times for few weeks and sometimes for one or two months uh, such a low temperature can exist and during that time of uh, a few weeks to few months uh, so lot lot of uh, distress comes into picture unless these things are taken care of it is extremely difficult Suppose if the construction happens during the winter where the temperature is rather close to zero or minus, minus one, <coughs> sorry, and also if you see the maximum temperature, so that is going almost up to 45 to 50 degree, 50 degree centigrade. So what is the difference? So 50 degree change in temperature. So it is too much of a temperature. And if you take the coefficient of thermal expansion, which is uh, being the strain which I have discussed in one of the earlier classes so that strain value need to be multiplied with 50 so that you are going to get the total strain so knowing one element of a structural component say you have a roof truss and in that roof truss you have a tension member whose length is say 2 meter and uh, that 2 meter of the tension member if it is fabricated during the winter season where we have not taken the temperature effect into consideration and when the summer with this temperature of 50 degree comes into picture so that element will have undergone expansion to a certain extent so sometimes it is a fraction of an mm and sometimes it can be even up to mm of deformation so that definitely introduces too much of stress especially to the joint and that joint over a time is subjected to fatigue effect and if this type of any uh, cyclic effect of the load happens uh, over a time of few years uh, so, so we have altogether a different types of structural action being seen in those structural components. So that is the reason. So many of these things play a very important role. And as I mentioned in my PPT presentation also, this uh, hydrostatic pressure in water retaining structure and soil pressure also is uh, another thing. And more information as far as the analysis and design is concerned, we will be able to get from this code. And of course, as mentioned, fatigue is also one of the important thing. So the fatigue is mainly because of the reversal of the load and uh, where you get some sort of a crack. So nano cracks and that nano crack sometimes uh, grow as a uh, micro crack, so leading to failure. So this is where the importance of fatigue comes into picture, especially in case of steel bridges, uh, this plays a very important role. And also we have many accidental loads uh, that are likely to come so leading to impact leading to collision and we have the accidental load because of the explosion that takes place where you must have stored some arms and ammunition knowingly or unknowingly so some fight can happen leading to a severe explosion so what is the amount of load so that is that is to be considered in the design of uh, the building which is uh, uh, which uh, which is being used for storing that material is also a, a matter of interest so we have the loads generated because of the impacts and collision and it also depends on many factors so what is the mass of the vehicle and what is the speed with which the vehicle is moving so many factors uh, comes into picture and how to calculate these loads is also being uh, discussed in greater detail and like that uh, loads because of explosion as I mentioned and of course uh, the vertical loads on air raid shelter so these are all some of the structures that goes below the soil so the basement structures so anyway so as i mentioned it is uh, just the introduction to these codes and depending on the situation so we may have to take these codes and start using it whenever an opportunity comes now coming to the load combinations i mentioned only few combinations so this is uh, what the combination being discussed in IS uh, 
800 uh, 2007 also so whatever the combination that is being discussed in IS 800 it is still mentioned here of course dead load is one combination so dead load imposed load dead load wind load dead load earthquake load so this is not going to be considered together it is a separate one dead load and temperature load so dead load imposed load wind load dead load imposed load and erection load so in addition to that we have few more important combinations so these combinations are not being discussed in IS 800 and many a times you get a very simple question in the examination so what are the various loads considered in the design of steel structures and discuss about the different load combination sometimes for 5 mark or 7 mark so generally we take the information as it is from the code but we need to discuss certain things on your own and many of the combinations as I mentioned so these special combinations you will not be writing many a times so please remember that few additional combinations of the loads also being considered and that is available in part 4 especially the special loads many a times we will not be writing the special loads so look into some of these things so write many of these things depending on the type of the question being asked so this is how all the four parts of the code so as far as uh, the loads and their combination is concerned comes into picture so let us go back uh, to the slide so this is uh, what uh, i was uh, just uh, discussing so we have discussed about the international codes of practices and uh, now the classification of sections so I will not be going in greater details as far as this classification of sections are concerned. So the classification is based on how the cross section of a beam is going to behave when it is stressed beyond the elastic limit. So some information in connection with uh, the plastic method of analysis and how the stress is getting distributed in the elastic condition when it goes to the plastic condition. So what happens and how the yielding of the cross section takes place elastic to plastic and in between you have the elastoplastic and lot lot of uh, introductory things uh, needed to be discussed uh, if I really want to take up this classification of section. So anyway this classification of section is already uh, made as uh, one small uh, uh, unit uh, in your uh, syllabus so that is the reason uh, I am trying to explain at this stage itself. So the detailed uh, discussion of this uh, again comes in uh, the design of beams which is discussed uh, which will be discussed in uh, module 5 and uh, for the benefit of uh, the students please remember the classification goes like this class 1 class 2 class 3 and class 4 and that is where we have the class 1 which is a plastic classification comes into picture as far as 2 is concerned it is a compact classification so third one is uh, the semi compact the fourth one is slender so whatever the explanation uh, so I have uh, put here is available in IS 800 also. So I will be explaining all these things so the students will be able to understand and appreciate and especially for some students. Uh, so still lot of information about uh, the classification of the section is available in IS 800. Even some of the theory part is also available and I will introduce to that uh, IS 800 uh, in the next class where many of the information connected with definition explanation will be able to take straight away from the code but don't simply copy the information just have a glance because we'll be having sufficient time in the examination and this code will be given as a reference for analysis and design but still we can go through some of these things and start uh, writing the explanation on your own so that is where uh, referring to the code comes into picture so you should not simply copy and transfer the information as it is so what is uh, important as far as these classifications are concerned so i will be just discussing uh, with the help of this particular graph so i will be explaining uh, this uh, graph uh, in the subsequent uh, classes also so what i want to tell you is you just uh, consider the example of a simply supported beam so if you have a simply supported beam over a span say l subjected to some load uh, maybe the point load or the udl so when the initial load is applied the beam definitely deflects so the beam is subjected to bending effect and the shear effect you know the variation of uh, bending moment across the cross uh, across the along the length of the beam 
but of course what happens to the cross section because of that meddy moment at that particular cross section we also know so a lot of bending stresses uh, comes into picture and we need to take the cross section where the bending moment is maximum and see what that bending moment is uh, uh, giving rise to in terms of stresses so that is the criteria to classify the section suppose uh, if you apply a load which produces a moment and as we increase the load the moment on the beam also increases and uh, the moment increases right from zero up to some value say m y so this is the situation where so we have the stress distribution something like this so where the distribution is uh, something like this depending on the moment what is the maximum stress so that comes into picture so because uh, the moment is still less than the yield moment the extreme fiber will uh, will not have reached the yield stress obviously the extreme fiber stress is much less than the yield stress but when you go towards the centroidal axis of the cross section the stress keep on decreases under the centroidal axis it will be zero so this is where the neutral axis comes into picture but when you increase the load further the moment also increases and uh, the extreme fiber stress after reaching the maximum value so it's not going to increase further because this is what we have seen in the stress strain diagram also once the yielding of the cross section starts so at that constant value of the stress so there is a continuous deformation happening so it can be the stress to strain deformation or it can be even the moment to the rotation uh, capacity of the section and uh, this is how the yielding of the cross section takes place as the moment is increased uh, beyond the yield so certain fibers in the extreme uh, from the neutral axis it yields and of course still we have the elastic uh, behavior near the center of the cross section and if you increase the load uh, further the moment also increases and there is a very possibility that the entire cross section will undergo yielding but if you see the situation when you load it further so the cross section may not be able to take additional moment but with that maximum value of the moment the cross section <coughs> certain portion of the beam undergoes continuous deformation so this is where the continuous rotation of certain length of the beam comes into picture so this is what is called as formation of hinge and the hinge rotation and many of these things i'll be discussing in this chapter itself uh, in the plastic method of analysis so what i want to tell you at this juncture uh, as far as the classification of the cross section is concerned so we have the plastic cross section where the cross section has completely yielded where the moment carrying capacity of the section is mp so it is resisting the fully plastified moment the fully plastified capacity is already seen in the section and that particular section of course some portion of the section undergoes continuous rotation so that is where the plastic cross section comes into picture and in case of a compact cross section of course uh, the cross section is uh, still completely plastified but it is not undergoing continuous rotation so that is the thing the situation of uh, plastic and compact is more or less same as far as the resisting capacity of the section is concerned where the resisting capacity is uh, mp but in plastic there is a continuous deformation continuous rotation of the plastic hinge happening but that type of a continuous rotation is not happening in the compact section so when you take say, take a semi compact section so the this section is not able to attain even the plastic capacity so it attains the capacity much more than the yield capacity so yield capacity is the capacity corresponding to the onset of yielding at the extreme fiber but here many fibers extreme top and also at the extreme bottom have yielded but a substantial portion near the center of the cross section has not yielded so obviously the moment carrying capacity of the semi compact section is definitely more than that of the slender section but it is substantially less uh, compared to either the compact or the plastic section but if the section is such that if it is slender then it is really not able to even uh, attain <coughs> either my and the question of resisting mp doesn't come into picture so much before reaching my the section undergo failure because of its slenderness ratio so that is where the local failure of the cross section comes into picture so this is uh, what the information you need to appreciate so you have to provide this particular uh, diagram in the examination in case uh, uh, some question in this direction comes into picture so how the steel sections are classified based on the moment rotation characteristics so this is 
a very important thing a pictorial representation you have to provide and the explanation to that is uh, already available in IS 800 and some information you can still uh, get it from IS code and try to manage the explanation on your own. So still lot of things uh, comes into picture as far as uh, these uh, classifications are concerned. So we need to see what different types of uh, cross section, what different types of elements that are there and what is the aspect ratio of the element and what is the length to thickness ratio, whether uh, the element itself is uh, uh, able to undergo local buckling or whether the element will undergo yielding or if it is a short element so definitely the member yields and there is no local buckling but still it is subjected to continuous deformation where the cross section is going to yield plastically so many of these things uh, comes into picture which i will be taking up in the next class so in the next class so types of elements and how these uh, elements are classified and uh, what is the ratio of uh, length of the element to the thickness so that whether the element is really plastic, compact, semi-compact that can be defined and whether there is uh, any complete yielding likely to happen or any premature failure of the cross section comes into picture. So all these things I uh, will be discussing in the next class. So let us stop at this stage my dear friends. So thank you very much uh, for uh, listening to my talk. And if you have any questions, uh, you can ask. Thank you very much.